Okay, here goes the first podcast pediatrician and podcastpediatrician.com rant. And it's a long one. Sometimes both Matt and I will share a rant. Sometimes we'll go mostly solo. I got this one. I'm trying for that sweet spot between Howard Beale and Louis Black and the Johns, Oliver and Stewart. And if interested, stay tuned at the end of this rant for a little scoop involving Lynn manuel Miranda, the Schuyler sisters, and Jane Austen. So, as Billy on the Street might say, my fellow NU alum, away we go. This first rant could have just been about Big Pharma in general. While this is tempting, and there's a huge amount of greed and unsavory practices in Big Pharma, as portrayed in movies such as The Constant Gardener, The Fugitive, and Mission Impossible 2, the last Tom Cruise movie I ever saw in theater, since a few years later he idiotically dismissed the severity and scope of postpartum depression and claimed he can cure it with vitamins, and then he went off on Brooke Shield, and no one messes with Brooke. Anyway, Big Pharma has been responsible for incredible life-saving drugs and employs over 4 million people, some of which are dear to my heart. The vast majority of Big Pharma people are dedicated, selfless individuals working for the common good. And the cures they have invented have been amazing. That said, exploding drug costs that go hand in hand with huge Big Pharma profits is a wildfire in my opinion, initially ignited by allowing direct consumer marketing of prescription drugs in the 1980s. They're now spending over $5 billion a year on those ads promoting prescription drugs and slyly pushing off-label uses also. The other big driver of high prices has been the infusion of venture capital money in the industry. And let's not forget Big Pharma's historic role in pushing prescription opiates as a non-addicting panacea leading to our huge national opioid addiction problems as they continue to hire away the DEA agents who try to regulate that industry. Props to John Oliver on that story. Big Pharma will tell you that they're actually saving healthcare money in the long run and that runaway hospital costs and greedy health insurers are the bigger problems. As they did in a podcast episode of Intelligence Squared where pharma apologists did a great job deflecting the facts. But overall... Their excuses are nonsense. Big Pharma cannot hide the fact that drug costs are rising more than any other segment of our healthcare industry, and their profits also outstrip the rest of healthcare while they enjoy the fruits of taxpayer funded NIH research. And Big Pharma also pays drug stores to sell them every doc's individual prescribing histories so the sales reps know what I prescribe better than I do while Rite Aid, CVS, Walgreens, Osco et al. make a tidy profit on this. So, full disclosure, I am part of the problem. I bought into their giving out savings cards to waive co-pays for the newest expensive drugs, while the insurance company still had to pay for these meds, which led to increased costs for everyone. And speaking of insurance companies, they will be a subject of a future rant the base pay of executives of insurance companies, and many hospitals for that matter, far, far outpace the doctors and certainly nurses, techs, etc., who actually provide the care. Plus, dealing with insurance companies from a patient perspective or doctor perspective is maddening. Yes, often, Blue Cross Blue sucks. Even worse of me, perhaps, is that I do allow drug reps to come into my practice to leave free samples and formula and bring occasional free lunches for my whole staff. So, if that makes me a hypocrite, then I am definitely a hypocrite. This will not be the last time that I admit that. I do rationalize that having the sales reps come in helps me keep up on the new products that are out there since my patients are seeing them on TV, and it also lets me directly quiz the drug reps on their slick handouts for new products and their claims for their new products. Plus, I can even push back on some of their overinflated claims a bit while I eat their free pizza and chicken and huge cookies. However, I do no longer go to any of their after-hour restaurant events. So there's that. For this rant, I also thought about just skewering hedge fund guy Martin Shkreli 
the Lord Voldemort of drug companies. He truly is the Dr. Evil of pharma, buying small drug companies and ruthlessly raising the price of their products, including one pill that treats a life-threatening infection in AIDS patients that he increased by over 5,000%. This is just one of many of his dastardly deeds. He was brought up last year on security fraud, and eventually he will be Satan's toy. However, his drugs don't touch on my practice as a pediatrician, so it's just not personal enough. So the winner of my first rant goes to Myland Pharmaceuticals, makers of EpiPen and EpiPen Jr. Yay! They really, really, really and truly suck. Or on Avenue Q, they suck, 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 suck. Now, Myland's main branded product is EpiPen and its little sister, EpiPen Jr., which are epinephrine, which is also known as adrenaline, auto injectors that can save the life of a child having an anaphylactic reaction to a drug or a food like peanuts. For parents of kids with severe life-threatening allergies, the specter of having their child die from an allergic reaction is real, and having epinephrine on hand to treat a possible exposure is not a choice. First, some product background. The drug epinephrine was first isolated in 1901, when Teddy Roosevelt was starting his first term as president and it is no longer under any patents. The cost of the actual epinephrine drug in the various epinephrine injectors right now ranges from about $1.06 to $1.30. The auto-injector device for delivering medications uses a spring-loaded pre-filled syringe designed to be given through clothes by a layperson and was invented first in the mid-1970s using taxpayer money by Sheldon Kaplan, a former NASA engineer who left NASA but refined his auto-injector for the military to use for a nerve gas antidote. It was called Combo Pen. Kaplan was working for survival technology later when he refigured his device to inject epinephrine into the now-named EpiPen auto-injector, which was approved by the FDA in 1987 for survival technology. Mr. Kaplan left a bit after that and received no royalties for EpiPen since Survival Technology owned the patent. He was your average middle-class suburban guy, an unsung hero for people with severe allergies. He died in 2009. Okay, now we get a bit biblical as any discussion of small drug companies must include how they all merge and get bought out over and over and over by other companies. I will use the word begat a remnant of my brain from seven tortured years of Hebrew school, even though none of these companies actually gave birth. So, survival technology begat Meridian Medical, which was part of Merck, which used day pharmaceuticals for marketing. In 2001, a twin pack of EpiPen was introduced, since in severe reactions, two separate injections of epinephrine are often needed. Meridian begat King Pharmaceuticals, and King Pharmaceuticals later was acquired by Pfizer. It's all confusing. In 2004, a twin pack of EpiPen cost about $106. The EpiPen eventually ended up with Merck KGAK. I have no idea how to pronounce that. A German company. In 2007, wait for it, Myland Pharmaceuticals appears in the scene and acquires the right to market the EpiPen from Merck, KGAK, through Meridian, which later became King and Pfizer. And they continued to use King and Pfizer as the contract manufacturer. At the time, EpiPen had sales of about $200 million and controlled about 90% of the epinephrine auto-injector market. Also in 2007, a possible competitor, Twinjet, was launched by Skelly and later Xiangi Pharmaceuticals, which allowed giving two doses of epinephrine with just one device, which sounds great, but it wasn't very user-friendly. To be clear, Myland still had no big competition, a dirt-cheap epinephrine drug price, and a great auto-injector technology for which they had no role developing whatsoever. Also in that 2007 year, Heather Bresch became the COO of Myland. 
She was formerly one of their main lobbyists who helped push the drug entitlement portion of the 2003 Medicare reform, a huge win for Big Pharma. Two years later, in 2009, Mylan marketed a new and improved EpiPen with a stronger spring and better packaging and labeling, which, to be fair, likely cost $10 million or so to completely redo. And then they raised their price to almost $140 per twin pack. Now, normally a drug company spends billions, yes, billions of dollars to develop and get approval of a new drug for premium pricing. Mylan did not invent anything and, again, does not even manufacture the EpiPen. In 2016, Mylan testified that they buy the EpiPen even now for $34.50 from King and Pfizer. Some in the industry estimate that the actual manufacturing and packaging cost of making it to begin with is about $10 for a two-pack. The bulk of the money Mylan spends on EpiPen is in marketing. Also in that 2009, Sanofi launched Intelliject, a new epinephrine injector invented by a company called Intelliject and their founders, the Edward Brothers. And we'll get back to those twin Edward Brothers later. And still in 2009, it was a big year, Teva Pharmaceutical, the big generic drug maker, which also reappears at the end of this saga, tried and failed to market a generic EpiPen after getting sued for patent infringement by multiple other drug companies. A year later, Skelly and Shianogi's two-dose Twinject had ultimately failed, so then they launched a new product called Adrenoclick that only delivered one dose per injector like the EpiPen. They authorized Pfizer to sell a generic form also. But remember, Pfizer had acquired King Pharmaceuticals, which was manufacturing Mylan's EpiPen. Even more confusing and incestuous and not exactly a recipe for competition. EpiPen still controlled over 90% of the market, and at the end of 2010, an EpiPen twin pack cost over $165, continuing the string of raising the EpiPen price an average of 15-20% to every year for parents and allergic children, well above inflation, and obviously manufacturing costs. Why? Because they could. In 2010 and 11, Pfizer and King Pharmaceuticals sued Sanofi over the Intelliject and also sued Novartis and Sandoz over their new planned generic epinephrine autoinjector. All the big pharma players were suing each other. All the while, Mylan continued its monopoly. And by the end of 2011, the EpiPen Twin Pack had jumped to $193.96 from $165 a year before. In 2012, Heather Bresch, the former lobbyist and COO of Mylan, became the CEO of Mylan. That year, Mylan launched its EpiPen for Schools with agreements to get EpiPens in all schools, originally only if the schools agreed to exclusively buy EpiPen auto-injectors. Later in 2012, the National Association of State Boards of Education, or NASB, launched a policy advocating to get state laws promoting epinephrine auto-injectors access for all schools. Many states later enacted these laws, and many other schools recommended them, which was wonderful for my land since they had a monopoly on the epinephrine auto-injectors. The NASB president-elect in 2010 and later president in 2012 was Gail Manchin, which probably led to a nice 2012 family celebration dinner since the new NASB president, Gail Manchin, and the new Mylan CEO, Heather Bresch, are mother and daughter. As a church lady may say, isn't that special? Oh, and yes, Heather's dad and Gail Manchin's hubby is the former governor and now senator from West Virginia, the Honorable Joe Manchin. Meanwhile, in the Batcave, in 2012, the FDA also approved the new auto-injector AviQ by Intelliject and those Edward twins, who later changed their company name to Calio. Now, AviQ is shaped like a rectangle, almost like a cell phone. It has a sound chip in it to verbally walk patients and parents who may be panicked through how to inject the medication 
into someone having a reaction. To inject, place black end against outer thigh, then press firmly and hold in place for five seconds. Five, four, three, two, one. Injection complete. Calio contracted with Sanofi to manufacture and distribute the AviQ. Calio is privately owned and started by those identical twin Edward brothers, Eric and Evan, who are weirdly kind of doppelgangers for the Winklevoss twins of Olympic and Social Network fame. These twin brothers grew up with severe allergies and are parents of children with severe allergies. So it is a wonderful story how one became an engineer, the other a physician, and they use their combined talents and experience to invent a great product. Unfortunately, they debuted AviQ at a ridiculous $400 price, which was way more than the cost of manufacturing would justify giving less than $1.30 of drug, in my opinion. They also made a similar auto-injector for opioid overdoses, which is also a great product and also outrageously priced. So, maybe in response to the AviQ price, in 2012, Heather Brush's first year as CEO, they hiked the EpiPen Twin Pack price to $252, up from $193.96 in 2011. Also in 2012, Shinogi, maker of that Adrenoclick, stopped making it and sold it to Amidra Pharmaceuticals. And in 2013, they relaunched the branded Adrenoclick, while more importantly, letting Lineage launch a generic epinephrine auto-injector, finally a usable generic alternative to the branded EpiPen. I remember this time because the Myelin rep came out to her office with all kinds of handouts about how the generic adrenoclick was inferior to the EpiPen. And I, being pretty ignorant of all the background on this, pretty much f swallowed it hook, line, and sinker. In 2013, President Obama signed the Access to Emergency Epinephrine Act, which is unofficially called, by his own staff, the EpiPen Law which protected anyone from liability when using an injectable epinephrine, which is a very, very, very good thing. But it also gave some financial incentives for schools to stock epinephrine auto-injectors, all the while with support from the now Senator Manchin. By the end of 2013, the EpiPen Twin Pack was up to $273.24. Now, 2014 was quite a bold one for my land pricing. Perhaps seeing the price of AviQ and now with legal financial incentives for their Monopoly product, they raised the twin pack price to $407.84, a 50% increase from the year before. In 2015, AviQ was voluntarily recalled by Sanofi for manufacturing problems. I'm guessing, but I suspect those Edward brothers were ruining the day they allowed Sanofi to be in charge of their AviQ manufacturing. Now with their main competitor out, Mylan then raised the EpiPen price from $407.84 to $537.80, a 32% rise after increasing at 50% the year before. Mylan now had $1.5 billion in sales and 40% of their profit was from EpiPen. By the spring of 2016, the EpiPen price was over $600, and the retail price in my local pharmacy when I called was over $700. Remember, the cost in 2016 to manufacture it was estimated to be at $10 per twin pack, and Mylan was buying it from King and Pfizer for $34.50. And then the poo hit the fan, and the EpiPen price gouging became a national story. Okay, you say, my land was a bit greedy. They took advantage of market forces and the incompetence of their rivals. Oh, but it gets worse, way worse, more after the break. For this first podcast pediatrician rant episode, I choose to endorse, and to be clear, they did not choose us, but to endorse the Republic of Palau. That's P-A-L-A-U. Palau is a tiny, independent island country founded in 1994 in Micronesia 
that is a paradise on earth, and they love Americans. They were the site of the famous World War II battle of Peleliu, and they have the heavenly and otherworldly rock islands and some of the best scuba sites on the planet. Now, I don't even scuba. I'm a little scared. My ears hurt when I go deep in the pool, but it's on my bucket list. But the snorkeling, kayaking, waterfalls, and foods are amazing. Well, the foods are okay. Maybe not amazing. But a true treasure of Palau is the Palauan people, the nicest and most gracious people around. Of course, visit Hawaii, Puerto Rico, and other U.S. beach island destinations. But if you want an exotic locale, which also hosted two of the best survivor seasons ever, one including Philly's own Stephanie LaGrosa, who is married to the ex-Philly Kyle Kendrick, and of course, poverty, then go to Palau. Remember, Palau is for the Palauans, but they love to share their country with eco-friendly Americans. Welcome back. We detailed how Mylan gouged the price of EpiPen over the years with the help of limited competition, family political ties, competitor incompetence. But again, you could say this is just the business, or as Ray Rhodes would say, the bidness. But Mylan went way beyond regular business. In October 2016, Mylan reached a settlement of $465 million for shortchanging Medicaid by reporting EpiPen as a generic drug, not a branded one, thus reducing the amount of rebates they needed to give back to Medicaid. This while they trumpeted to me proudly that they were not generic and that generics were inferior. Mylan also had the second highest executive compensation package in the pharma industry. Now, while big pharma CEOs are paid 71% more than the median CEOs in other S&P companies over the past five years, which is the highest of any of the 10 sectors, which is staggering, it was seen as highly unusual that Mylan, a relatively small pharma player, ranking number 11 in revenue and number 16 in market capitalization, paid its top five managers over $292 million in the past five years. The Mylan top three, including Heather Bresch, got over $70 million each. In those five years, Mylan was the only pharma company to have three executives in the top 20 in compensation. Only one company had as many as two, and that company, Regeneron, which is almost twice as big as Mylan, develops new novel meds for killer diseases. Mylan has never invented any significant drugs. The Mylan top compensation was a huge outlier compared to big companies like J&J, Eli Lilly, and Pfizer. This is ultra greedy even by pharma standards, especially, again, for a company that makes no new or innovative medications. But wait, there's even more. Mylan is also one of the leading exploiters of tax inversion. They bought a small generic medication manufacturing company in the Netherlands. And then in 2014, Mylan incorporated in the Netherlands, all the while keeping their operational headquarters in the United States, but avoiding U.S. taxes, taxes that help support the U.S. government and those who serve it, like Heather Brush's dad, Senator Manchin. Also this year, a class action lawsuit was filed in October over the Mylan EpiPen price increases. And since Mylan is the gift that keeps on giving, in mid-December, 20 states filed civil complaints against Mylan and Teva Pharmaceuticals, remember Teva, for brazen price-fixing schemes for their generic drugs. So it appears while they were price-gouging EpiPen, their only branded drug, Mylan may have been up to dirty tricks with their generics too. And since over 80% of U.S. drugs are generic, this is a huge deal. When the story broke last year about the outrageous EpiPen price gouging, Mylan did a lot of dancing, but refused to lower their price. What they're now trying to do is add EpiPen to the coveted list of preventive services recommended by the United States Preventive Services Task Force. If they succeed, it would mean that patients would never have to pay a copay for an EpiPen and ensure that Medicaid and Medicare would have to pick up the entire cost 
of their near monopoly drug, thus removing the last modicum of any type of price check. This list of preventative medical services includes immunizations, lead testing, autism and depression screening. There's no prescription drugs for diagnosed illnesses on any of these lists. EpiPen is not a preventative drug. Putting EpiPen on this list is beyond ridiculous. Okay, I laid out my case of why I think Mylan is awful. But a rant without any suggestions for how pediatric caregivers and parents can do something is like spinning in the wind or throwing up on a spinning carnival ride on a windy day, which I've done. So, we pediatric caregivers can start by prescribing the generic EpiPen auto-injectors, knowing that it's not as slick as the EpiPens and that the needle does need to be recapped and that it does not come with a trainer. I have that handout made by Mylan that outlines all the differences between the EpiPen and generic that was made to discourage generic use, but I use it to show parents how little difference there really is. We also have to make sure that the generic auto-injectors are listed in our EMR and that our local pharmacies carry them, since EpiPen became such a monopoly that many pharmacies do not stock the generic epinephrine auto-injectors, and that can only be changed by prescribing it more and talking to your friendly neighborhood pharmacist. But in very late-breaking news, CVS is now offering the generic Adrenoclick epinephrine auto-injector for $109.99 for a two-pack, by far the lowest price on the market. Hoo-ya! Okay, Walgreen and Rite Aid and Dwayne Reed, and yes, you too, Jewel Osco in Chicagoland, step up and meet the CVS challenge. Hopefully, savvy parents will be open to generic epinephrine. Now, if my parents want branded epinephrine, branded EpiPens, I certainly will prescribe it. But I do explain my reasons for going generic, and most have been receptive. Now, Mylan is talking about launching a half-price generic version with better savings cards that may be very attractive to families, but for all the reasons of this little rant, do you really want to support Mylan? Actions have consequences. Attention must be paid. And what about AviQ, which is a nice product with its cool size and sound chip and a great back history of those Edward twins? Well, they just relaunched their... AviQ again with Calio itself manufacturing their product in Indiana. Now, in the press, it was quoted as something called a whack price of $4,500 each, which is truly wacky. But for those families earning under $100,000 without government or commercial insurance, it will be completely free. And for those who earn over $100,000, they can buy it for $360. Now, everyone else with commercial insurance can get it supposedly with no out-of-pocket expense if they order it through their new special direct delivery program. It all sounds kind of crazy. My first choice would still be the generic, yet if you want a more deluxe auto-injector that talks you through the injection, it might make sense. But I still worry about a bait-and-switch later when they get a toehold in the market. And this direct delivery precedent that bypasses your local friendly neighborhood pharmacy is disturbing. The jury is still out. I would have preferred they had just set a reasonable price for everyone. Meanwhile, we should also modify our state pharmacy substitution laws so that the pharmacist can freely substitute generic epinephrine auto-injectors unless it is specified brand medically necessary by the doctor, physician assistant, or the nurse practitioner. If state governments are buying epinephrine auto-injectors for schools, then they should be able to negotiate with all competitors and sometimes set max prices. The drug makers can accept it or they can lose revenue. Meanwhile, in the big picture of Big Pharma, I do personally support the recent bipartisan legislation that will speed up FDA approval of new prescription drugs and medical devices. It's not perfect, but it's a start and it's needed. We also need to speed up the FDA approval of generics. And we need to reform the drug patent laws so drug companies can't just make small changes to their product and keep extending their patents over and over and over. Now, as a pediatrician, I must add that some of the items on that U.S. preventative services list that have no competition, like Pfizer's pneumococcal Prevnar vaccine, also need some price controls, as they annually raise their price about 6% just because they can. Please allow Medicare to negotiate on behalf 
of its 40 million beneficiaries. Medicare savings tend to trickle down to pediatric medicine. And lastly, why should U.S. citizens pay outrageously more for meds than people in Europe and other developed countries similar to the U.S.? We're being screwed. Let us at least buy meds directly from Canada. Okay, I'm spent. In a few moments, a podcast pediatrician, podcastpediatrician.com, bonus exclusive scoop involving Lin-Manuel Miranda, the Schuyler sisters, and Jane Austen. Yay, you survived that long, long rant. Now, I believe this episode will not air until April 1st. So by that time, this incredible breaking story will be out, and I won't be compromising my sources. But I will say it was not from any of the guys from the Room Where It's Happening podcast. Basically, Lin-Manuel Miranda is writing a follow-up to his transcendent, groundbreaking musical, Hamilton. It is tentatively titled, And Peggy, with an exclamation point at the end, kind of like Jeb, but hopefully a bit more successful. This new musical is based on new sources uncovered by Ron Chernow that details the long, close, personal relationship between Jane Austen, who started visiting London in 1796, and Angelica Schuyler Church, who lived in London from 1785 to 1797. Jane and Angelica first met in London in 1796, and although Angelica was almost 20 years older than Jane, they bonded instantly and kept up a faithful letter correspondence until Angelica's death in 1814. These letters were recently uncovered by Chernow in an estate in Newburgh, New York. Now here is the huge bombshell. Jane Austen's book, Pride and Prejudice, published in 1813, is based on the romance between Eliza Schuyler and, wait for it, you guessed it, Alexander Hamilton. Yes, this means that Alexander Hamilton is Fitzwilliam Darcy, Mr. Darcy. Furthermore, these letters between Angelica and Jane point to a dalliance involving Peggy, who is Angelica and Eliza's younger sister, with none other than Aaron Burr, occurring in 1779, a year before Eliza's 1780 marriage to Alexander Hamilton and when Peggy had not yet turned 21 years of age. It is clear that Angelica confided in Jane about the entire affair between Peggy and Aaron Burr. Mr. Burr refused to do the honorable thing and marry Peggy Schuyler, which forced Peggy's father, Philip Schuyler, to step in and pay large amounts of money to cover up the potential scandal, all with the help of Alexander Hamilton. Now, it turns out that Mr. Burr had tried to woo Eliza Schuyler in the past, and later, Eliza at first assumed that Alexander Hamilton knew that his army buddy, Aaron Burr, had designs on Peggy. It took a while, but Eliza eventually realized she was completely wrong about Alexander Hamilton's character. Now, Hamilton was incensed by Spur's actions, but promised Philip Schuyler and his daughters Angelica, Eliza, and especially Peggy, that he would never confront Aaron Burr about Burr's dishonorable actions, fearing that Burr would still ruin Peggy's reputation. Apparently, Jane Austen was captivated by her friend Angelica's story about Peggy and Burr, but she knew that she had to be careful putting it into print to avoid forever rupturing her close, dear friendship with Angelica Schuyler. So Jane Austen cleverly reversed many of the details. She made the Schuyler family, now renamed the Bennett family, wealthy instead of poor, and renamed the Schuyler mansion in Albany as the Pemberley Estate. The Schuyler country house in Schuylerville, New York, became Netherfield. She kept the five daughters of the Schuylers intact, who became the five Bennett sisters. Yes, in real life, Angelica had two more sisters, Cornelia and Catherine. The latter name Austin kept for Catherine, call me Kitty, Bennett. But Miss Austin erased all the Schuyler brothers. 
she did change Angelica's name for the Pride and Prejudice book to her own name, Jane, since she loved Angelica so much. And she also kept Jane a beauty in the book, but she made her Angelica character Jane a bit slow-witted in contrast to the razor-sharp intellect of the real Angelica, so no one would guess who she really was. She could not bear to completely change the name of her main protagonist, Eliza Schuyler, so she just made her Elizabeth Bennett. Obviously, this name choice cannot be a coincidence. Aaron Burr is clearly George Wickham from the novel, both orphans, as are Hamilton and Mr. Darcy. And Peggy Schuyler, known as quite the firecracker in her youth, with a penchant for bad boys in uniform, was reborn as Lydia Bennett. Alexander Hamilton's middle name has never been known, but according to these Angelica and Jane letters, actually it was Fitzwilliam, an Irish name bestowed on him by Hamilton's mean-spirited father, a middle name that Alexander refused to acknowledge. Mr. Bingley is obviously based on John Lawrence, who did briefly date Angelica Schuyler in 1777, right before Angelica was married to John Church. Evidently, Mr. Lawrence was in a happy marriage and was not romantic in that way, and he and Angelica actually became more like brother and sister. It is unclear how the brilliant Mr. Miranda will approach the retelling of the story centering on Peggy. It is fascinating to consider that Miranda might even use Jane Austen as a character in his musical, and focus on the now-growing conjecture that the real reason for the famous Hamilton-Burr duel is that Alexander Hamilton was finally able to fight Burr after Hamilton was with Peggy at her deathbed in 1801, and while his father-in-law, Philip Schuyler, lay dying at the time of the duel between Hamilton and Vice President Burr in July of 1804. Maybe Peggy's dying wish was for Hamilton to finally avenge her honor, or perhaps Hamilton felt unshackled with Peggy and his father-in-law now gone. Reportedly, the public has already signed on to the debut of And Peggy before a likely Broadway run. There is no word if Mr. Miranda himself will reprise the role of Hamilton, but Jonathan Goff has already signed on to be King George, although it is unclear if the king will, in fact, have any part in this new musical. Nathan Lane is reportedly interested in playing any possible version of Mr. Collins. Jasmine Cephas Jones is interested in reprising her role as Peggy, and the rumor has it that her real-life father, Ron Cephas Jones, of Mr. Robot and This Is Us fame, may play Philip Schuyler, Peggy's father. His Mr. Robot co-star, Rami Malek, is also rumored to be interested in playing Mr. Burr. Matt, what are you doing here? Just got back from Paris, Texas. What did I miss? <laughs> you still don't know what that means. I have well, no idea. just the Big Farmer rant and some April Fool's Day Broadway stuff that you would definitely not be interested in. No, nah, not interested in the Broadway stuff, but I missed a Big Farmer rant. Did you rant about Crestcore and Mellencrop Pharmaceuticals? I have no idea what you're talking about. Well, Questcore and Mellencrop Pharmaceuticals raised the price of Acthar Gel, which is about the only medication to treat infantile spasms, a potentially, as you know, devastating form yes. of epilepsy in babies, from $40 a vial in 2001 to $34,000 no, now no per way. vial. No yeah. Way. Oh, yeah. That's an eight, I did the math. That's an 85,000% increase in oh. it. That's, <laughs> in that's 15 years. Stunning. Yeah, I mean, they were sued by the Federal Trade Commission and now have to pay $100 million for anti competitive behavior because they purchased the only possible alternative to their drug, their monopoly, for $135 million from Novartis and t locked it away so there would be no competition. You know, it's like, it really is like some of these pharma, big pharma companies are like Batman villains. <laughs> you know, they, you know they, they can join, I think uh, Mallinckrodt can join. Martin Shkreli and Milan in the pharma axis of evil. But all right, since you're here, stick around. We'll do one more pearls and faux pas in a minute. Welcome back to Podcast Petricians. And don't forget podcastpetricians.com where you can share 
um, your ideas and thoughts. And we're going to now do a, a little bit more pearls and faux pas. This is Rob and Matt, Matt and Rob. And the first pearl I want to give now is something called a stitch cutter. It is a little device. It's disposable. It costs about 50 cents each. And it's curved, and it has a sharp side on the curve and the inner curve. So you can take out the stitches without using what I used to use is these scissors with a curved side. And the kids would move, and it took forever, and my back would hurt. And this has been a revelation. It also is something that one of my partners was using for years and without telling me or I didn't realize. And so uh, – Not a lot of, of sharing going I, on over there no, in your we practice. usually do. I'm like, why like, didn't yeah. you tell me? <laughs> Dr. S, why didn't you tell me about this? It's on the other side of the office. Nice. But um, these little things are, are just amazing. You use your tweezers. You pull up the stitch. So many stitches. It seems like more and more they're really tiny or maybe I guess my eyes yeah. are going. And sometimes there's a whole run of stitches and there's scabs and crud all over them. And it's hard to get them. <laughs> and you just pull it up and just touch it and it comes right out. So wow. it's faster. So the kids are happier. The parents are happier. I'm happier. Especially if you add on the magnifying glasses that go around your head. When I first started my practice, I took over from a pediatrician, Dr. Matt McDermott, kind of a legendary pediatrics in Delaware. And he had one of these magnifying glasses things in each room. And he said, these are for you. And I'm looking and I'm like, I'm never going to use them. <laughs> I'm going to retire. I'm going to quit before I have to use that thing. And then about six or seven years ago... It's like, oh, these are really good <laughs> um, as, as we hit in our 50s. Oh, yeah. So, yeah, um, so you there. put those magnifying mm -hmm. glasses on. You use these um, devices. It's by the uh, Cincinnati Surgical Company. Again, about 50 cents each when you buy them in bulk. Um, people may say, oh, but they're, they're not reusable. It's a waste of resources. True. But uh, hopefully the steel is made in the United States. I highly, highly recommend that uh, if you're taking out stitches in your office – and you're not, and you're still using the old-fashioned sti um, scissors. You think about getting these stitch cutters. Is that, is that what you're using, Matt? Because you're state of the art. I'm sure you're using. <laughs> not in this situation. No, we we still use the uh, the old-fashioned scissor. Although now that you've mentioned this, this, is the first I've ever heard of this. I think we're gonna have to change our ways. Yeah, I, the uh, the old school scissors for stitch removal that have the little curve on the end. I gotta say, I've never been a fan of those, just because at least once or twice I felt. As if the child, as the child moved, like I was going to yank the stitch out, as opposed to you know, kind of effortlessly cut it out. So I've always used straight edge um, scissors, but this so really that's good. So like if the child moves, spoon. you can just stab them with. It. <laughs> well, you know, <laughs> no, I've already stabbed them. That's what gets them to stay still. <laughs> no, so so as as certainly as my practice moves forward, that sounds like a like a great uh, great option to to use for suture removal. All right, so, and I have mm -hmm. nothing to do with the company. We don't have anything. So. No. Um, so now a faux pas. I gave a pretty bad one, so I'm hoping that Matt's going to be honest. Uh, I don't know. And give I think I could one. probably top it. You know, we certainly have both had our, had our experiences that we have regretted in terms of decisions we've made or or not made, for that matter. So mine goes actually. This is particularly close to my heart because it happened with one of my very best friends. Uh, daughters. Their oldest daughter had an issue where the parent, her parents were telling me that she was getting short of breath. And uh, this is a family that has um, a fair amount of asthma. And so when I, the first thing I thought about when she was about six or seven years old was, oh, you know, maybe we're just not controlling her asthma well enough. So we went for the inhaled corticosteroid and geez, she was still getting short of breath and a little bit diaphoretic when she ran around and just seemed that like means she wasn't sweaty. herself. Sweat day. Um, it just wasn't really herself. And so um, I stepped it up. Let's add some singular. Let's see what's going on here. Really couldn't get good peak flows on her and, uh, you know, hadn't sent her off to see pulmonology. But uh, eventually I did. And, uh, and through a much better history than I took, although I knew most of this already, it was revealed that the family had hereditary hemorrhagic telangiectasia, and the girl had been having excessive nosebleeds for the last, oh, two years. So when they checked her hemoglobin, it was 5.5. .5. So, <laughs> <laughs> so uh -huh. I, I am extraordinarily thankful to my friends that they didn't fire me right there and perhaps stab me with suture scissors, but um, they are still great friends of ours. And, uh, and this young lady got herself squared away with some iron uh, and, and, uh, and a little bit of um, uh, treatment in terms of her, uh, her nosebleeds. 
And uh, thankfully, she is uh, she's good as new after her pediatrician completely screwed that's, up the job. That's a really <laughs> rare, rare condition. But yeah, again, you've, no, you but remember I knew the family history wonderfully well. I mean, yeah. I wrote it down every time I saw her. And I'm like, duh, put two and two together, right? Uh, ay, and, ay, ay, what a yeah. knucklehead. And that concludes this rant plus Hamilton episode. We'll be knee deep in poop when you hear from us next. Have a great day. Productions. All rights reserved.